yeah, so that um, that that Orson Welles um, uh, novel that was then uh, put as a uh, as a radio pr production in those days uh, caused widespread panic. People really believed that that uh, science fiction was actually true, and based on that was uh, the War of the Worlds, and that uh, it's a musical with um, very recognizable music. Uh, and I think it was Richard Burton who did the voiceover for uh, the narration side of that musical. Um, if, if I remember afterwards, I'll post a little bit of it, a link at least to, uh, to YouTube where you can, where you can uh, go and look at that. Anyway, that's beside the point. The, uh, the panic that this coronavirus seems to be having seems to be like those triffids, they were called triffids, in, um, in the war of the worlds these these things are sort of like just endemic and creeping closer and everyone was under threat and you just didn't know when this when this like mold thing would just come and, and, and overtake the, uh, the, the the village and and kill people and new new rockets were being sent off of mars and as they landed on the earth and exploded they they sent this triffid like plant like slimy creeper thing uh, across the ground, and you know, if, if pe people were just becoming more and more panicky about it. And there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a sense of that. Um, and I was trying to think, what is why why are we feeling a little bit more more agitated? I mean, up until a month ago when Mum died, um, the coronavirus was something that Yvonne and I were talking about that seemed to be way over there on the other side of this ocean behind us, you know. Uh, it, we had to be careful, but it wasn't going to come our way. Um, and then the big wake-up call was uh, to find out after the day, the day after Mama died, that she had died of, um, of COVID. And uh, then all of a sudden, the reality of having to face that. And it's like, oh my goodness, this is, uh, this is for real. This is us. Um, the uh, you know what's going to happen over the next fortnight? Are we going to end up in ICU? Uh, you know, um, how, and I, I had a lot of guilt and sort of felt this burden of responsibility and accountability for having taken Yvonne to go and see my mom uh, on that last day. And I kind of thought, how selfish! I did it for my mom. But I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined that the day afterwards we'd find out that uh, she had the virus. We thought she was in a very safe place, and uh, that, that we were sort of impervious on the beach. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Pam, you're so cool. <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> Subtitles. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so I, I, you know, the, the morning. Um, so the Thursday, mom died, and we, on the, the Friday morning, Yvonne and I were sitting in bed, as we usually do, just having a cup of coffee, chatting about the, uh, the past, of, you know, the, the, the day before and the sadness of losing mom. And we get the message from my sister saying that mom and dad, you know, was a positive, a tested positive. And then we just, we both just looked at each other. And it's like, put the coffee down. And it's like, what now? You know? Um, one of us could be dead within the next fortnight. Uh, we, we don't know. And I, I never said it to Yvonne, but I, I had this awful feeling like, what if she dies? Uh, and it's going to be my responsibility. How am I going to face uh, Yasin and Tariq or Granny uh, you know, and, and say, you know, we were irresponsible? Uh, that's just a, an awful thing. And I know that you know, then by the Sunday we'd gone, I remember we cancelled the circle on that Sunday, we went off to go and get tested, and then we were, found out we were negative, and well, here we are, and all's okay. Um, but then the, ne the next wave of uh, COVID, by, uh, the co you know, coronavirus news had sort of come to us, and I was like, oh no, not there now. Um, and then with uh, this very close friend of ours yesterday who died, uh, and he's young, he's 60. Yeah, 60. Um, and a very fit person, you know, uh, a, a great sportsman, um, but just succumbed to it. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the family's in a state of devastation over this. They were certainly not prepared for what had happened. And <clears throat> what made me, I don't really want to go down that line today, but, but 
it's it's part of the story and i suppose storytelling is really what this circle of friends is about is to try and create a story and a, a narrative around all of these happenings so this morning i was having a look at some of the titles of the most recent um uh, 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 circle of friends meetings and their titles like about meditation and mindfulness which we did last week and uh, we also uh, put up about uh, when, when uh, the Ramdas organization had put out silence is, you know um, silence is tantamount to acceptance of things and how somehow we we can't just step by and, and watch the world go by uh, with all of its nonsense without actually expressing an opinion without saying something and do we have the bravery or do we have the temerity to go out there and actually say something that we need to say and before then were other um circle of friends things that just hovered around some of these subjects um and we're sitting we're sitting in a in a crazy place we're sitting in a place where we see covid as a as a gift in a way it carries a silver lining it's uh with all the sadness and with all the loss uh in my own mother um i have to in a way maybe i justify it like that i justify the loss like that but i i kind of find that there is a silver lining to this there is a a, a gift that this virus brings to us um and we ourselves have sat in many circle of meetings uh, circle of friends meetings before and we've spoken about how does mother earth reclaim that um which we are eroding we're like an acid on this on this planet and we're just corrosive and wherever we go we just peel away and destroy uh, efface the mother nature when i was writing one of those blogs i uh, the vision was very clear of how we rape our mother really and how disgusting that whole that whole notion is uh and so here on the one hand we've got what we can clearly see as thinkers um as compassionate thinkers about earth and, and the plight of earth we can see uh the benefit of the virus in a sense somehow something's got to happen on this planet for mother earth to go through some kind of fever and to sweat us off uh we can't continue to sustain human life in the way that we know it um and we look at we another one of those gifts that coronavirus uh, virus has brought us is the widespread realization that people are having who are not even part of a a, a group of thinkers like we are these are i don't want to demean them uh, by no means but it's just that these kind of ideas have never come onto the onto the radar of their consciousness and now that they're under lockdown now that they having bereavement now that there is the sense of loss their value system has shifted from one of prada shoes and fancy cars and um ostentatious things uh put out there as window dressing for other people to see how how important and valuable they are in community um and without without eyes to see and without people to come into your house and without being able to drive anywhere what's the value of having a big fat porsche a red porsche uh parked in your driveway or in your garage uh when you can't go driving around uh, around the city for people to see it and what's the value of having a pair of red prada shoes high heel shoes stuck in your wardrobe when there's no one to see you wear them um what what people are saying to me when they do come because we've opened up the practice for in person um sessions now is they say one lady said to me just just on uh wednesday she says do you know what i by and large just walk around the day with my pajamas on and every day i you know take on a new a clean pair of pajamas but i never really get out of the pajamas and if i have to have a business meeting because she's in the film industry she says i just can't put a blouse over the top of it and it all looks fine but heaven forbid if i had to stand up uh during during my zoom meeting because i would be exposed wearing my pajamas and my most comfortable shoes um are my slippers 
And guess what? You know, my slippers. I wore I wear them around around the place. I I don't. I'm not wearing anything but slippers at the moment, unless I have to go somewhere. You know, well, I, I'm wearing more than slippers. Thank you. So. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lucky for you? Right? <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the whole value system is tending to shift away from that which is material, cold, sterile, tangible, show-offish, ostentatious uh, stuff to stuff that is now practical, like the slippers and the, and the pajamas for this lady who slumps around her house that way. Um, it's nice, it's cozy, it's, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to have fancy things. The fancy things around your house are, are the, things, the things you're using, are the things that are practical and, and houses would eventually, I suppose, collect more of those things that, are, uh, that add to the immediate value of life uh, to make it nice. Um, rather than all of the show off stuff that um, you would need visitors to the house to come and see, almost as though they're coming into a museum of your, or a testimony or a, or, or a, um, a palace of your, of, of your wealth uh, to, to show off that. Um, and people are going also, another one of those gifts is that interpersonal relationships are changing. Uh, people are starting to become a lot more forgiving uh, in some cases, I mean, domestic violence um, is on the rise big time. It's just spiked. I saw the crime stats uh, published by the South African Peace for the last couple of months. And uh, domestic violence is now skyrocketing. It's just crazy. People cannot live with each other in certain uh, cases. But they're having to learn new techniques. They're having to learn uh, new skills in life. Whereas in the past, they were able to go to their offices, to their respective places, leave each other for the core of the day, um, and, and go and interact with other people. Now they're not interacting with those people out there, and now they're forced to stay together in the same place, and they're having to now find ways of uh, finding sustainability in their relationship at close quarters. And this, for some, can be deeply, deeply claustrophobic. It's the kind of stuff that's popping up in the practice very often is the claustrophobia of living together in spaces where you cannot escape. You know, we, we all have beautiful places where we've got open vistas and space. And even Marlene there in Switzerland, you've got that beautiful view over the lake and, you know, you can get out and do some things. But imagine if you're living in one of these four ways townhouses and you're close quarters with each other. Uh, and there's no garden, and all you've got is you 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 just you you stuck there with um, with your spouse and your children, and especially if they're rowdy children, uh, slightly undisciplined children that want to get out and play, and they can't. Um, it's a it's a problem. Let me just let Nikki in quickly. By the way, hello, Marna. I never had a chance to say hello. Um, so here with. Uh, uh, we'll wait for Nikki to come in properly. Uh, here with uh, the, 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 the tension of, of the virus, uh, people are having to learn new skills. But aren't these skills, and that's the point I want to make, aren't these, aren't these isn't where life seems to be flowing as a river now, isn't this very much where we were dreaming about, we, or not even you know, speculating about is the word I'm looking for, because somehow we need Mother Earth to reclaim um, life in another, in, in, she needs to give us a kick in the butt. Uh, and isn't this partly that kick in the butt? We've, we've said, how, how does Earth suddenly reduce this enormous population that we have? How does it find a balance? How, what comes along? Surely there's going to be biblical pestilence and volcanoes. And if you think about those predictions of Revelation and Armageddon, it's, uh, it's about volcanoes and pestilence and very much like uh, Moses uh, brought upon uh, Egypt in the, uh, you know, in the uh, stories before the Exodus. 
um, and and perhaps perhaps it takes something like this, and then uh, you you look at you look at how uh, leadership, uh, national leadership, uh, and and that power uh, just these leaders are, are not being noble. There are many that are noble. I see that uh, Jacinda Arendt, um, the New Zealand Prime Minister, was voted as the most gentle and compassionate of all the world leaders uh, in this past uh, period of history. Um, and how, how that femininity, that, that, that motherliness, that compassion seems to be so important. And if only we could get rid of these uh, Putins and you Trumps. know Trumps and or, you know all, all of them that is just this male dominant force that is just so wanting to hang on to power at all costs, um, and we could get that that motherly um, matriarchal uh, energy into world leadership that could change things for the better. I think. I think it's time for the shift to fall away from patriarchal male dominant male dominant societies to maybe an, a, a much greater element of uh, of maternal uh, um, matriarchal uh, leadership. If it's the Jacinda Arendt uh, style, hey, I'm all for that. By the way, hello, Nikki. Um, so there is there's a war here. In a, in a way. Um, and the moment I thought of this kind of internal war, I thought of um, the Bhagavad Gita. And the story in the Bhagavad Gita is, has a parallel to this in a way. Um, and for, for some of us, we know what the, the Gita, the story of the Gita is, the backstory of the Gita really is. Um, but just let me, in a paragraph or two, just sum up uh, what happened, what the story is about. Here is a kingdom um, in ancient uh, um, India. Uh, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a leader, there's a, the, 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 the king, uh, and this king has two sons. Okay, bye. Um, the king has two sons. The younger son has no heir to the kingdom. The older son, who has the heir to the kingdom, uh, is blind, and so he's handicapped. And so here you can all already see that there's conflict between these two. Who, who should the kingdom go to when the reigning king, the father, dies? Uh, does it go to the blind king who is incapable of running the kingdom, and who also so happens to be very materialistic in his outlook in life? Or does it go to the younger son who's not entitled to the kingdom? He has no title to the kingdom. He has, he's not an heir to the kingdom. Uh, yet he has his own faculties and he's very gentle and spiritual. Uh, and that's the backstory against which the Bhagavad Gita is set. Eventually, this comes to a, to a head. There's no negotiation between these two brothers. And um, the... Uh, as, as they come to conflict, they come to conflict in a uh, tract of land um, some 200 kilometers north of Delhi in a, in a place called the fields of Kurukechra. And that's the story. Here they are lined up, facing each other in battle. The battle is an impending battle. Uh, and they're all in their chariots. And you can just imagine the chariots and the horses and the chaos. And uh, these are not two countries that are at war with each other. These are two factions of the same family. And the, as two factions of the same family, you've got the one that are just frothing at the mouth, just ready to take the kingdom. This is, these are those uh, loyal to the blind son. And you've got the other uh, group of people who are defending the kingdom and the spirituality of this kingdom and the uh, they are the, um, the, 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 the followers or supporters of the younger brother. And the younger brother's name is Arjuna. He is quite key to the story. And so the, both, both of these factions, as they lined up on this field, 
with their horses and their chariots and the dust and all the chaos and the noise, you can just imagine it. And they're all threatening each other. Uh, the leaders of either faction both spend time praying to God. And isn't that always so ironical? Um, it's, uh, you know, even on the dollar bill, you say, in, you see it's printed there, in God we trust. Um, God, God is on our side. Um, but then, you know, inshallah, the, uh, the, 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 the Islamic Muslims are also calling to God and God is on their side. And wherever you see these kind of wars, it's like, who should God support now? Um, since both are God's creation and since both are, uh, are, are um, children of the divine and both are faithful adherents to the fact that they will sacrifice their lives for God. Um, if God is sitting there as this P.W. Boerter character scratching his head, he must have this incredible dilemma as to who do I offer my support to? Um, yeah, I, I can't align myself with one or other, but both of these factions will ask for that kind of support. They will demand that kind of support. They will believe that they have an exclusive right to, uh, to, their, uh, to, to God's support. And the Gita carries this element of the story in it because both of these um, uh, 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 factions of the, of the split family, both of them call on Krishna, they, they pray to Krishna, an avatar of God. He's the blue guy, this guy that you see here. Uh, you've seen, you've seen that, that picture of, uh, of, of Krishna. Let's just try and get it there. You've seen that picture of Krishna quite often. Uh, so Krishna, in, in, just let me digress for half a second, in Hinduism, there's, it's, uh, people criticize Hinduism for being uh, not a monotheistic religion. In, it's a polytheistic religion. It has many gods. And um, if you dig into uh, um, Hinduism, it doesn't take one too long to realize that it's not really a polytheistic um, um, religion at all. It is definitely a monotheistic religion, but that each of these elements, uh, each of those deities, of those hundreds of thousands of deities that you get to see, each one represents another aspect of the divine. Um, and so um, you'll see the um, uh, 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 Hanuman, the monkey god, uh, he's about agility and speed, and you'll see behind Ken the the um, the the the, uh, the Ganesh, uh, and the Ganesh there is about uh, is about opening up pathways and 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 opening up life, it's clearing and pushing, um, and so each of these uh, uh, each of these deities has has symbolism as an aspect of the divine. Show us, Ken. Uh, closer, closer. Closer, closer. It's coming out of the background now. There, uh, your background wants to keep taking over. It just doesn't work. What you'd have to do is just temporarily turn off your, your background screen and then we'd see it. It just fades into the other picture. But I'm sure that's Ganesha that you're showing us there. Yeah. So, um, uh, Krish, um, Krishna is the sort of one of those high level avatars of the divine, uh, a representation of the divine. And it would take us uh, the rest of today just to even introduce him properly. But suffice it to say that both factions of, of this family in dispute with one another both pray to, to Krishna. And uh, Krishna's quite clever. Krishna says, I'll help you both. Um, I'm not going to take sides at all. But the way it works, says Krishna, I will offer you one of, I will offer to one of you all my might and all my power. And to the other, I will offer you all of my wisdom. So which do you want? And the materialistic side of the family, this, uh, the one to uh, rule the kingdom because it's their right, it's their, it's their birthright, they call on all of Krishna's might and power. 
and you can just imagine what that entails. If, if, um, if God said, I will offer you all of my might and power, you can just imagine how much might and power that, uh, that gift would be. Um, Arjuna, the representative of the more spiritual side, uh, he asks for all of, all of Krishna's uh, guidance and wisdom. So this story so far, we see it as a real faction out there on the fields of Kurukeshra. But it's, it's, it's a parable, like all of these stories are. It's also a story about how we are within. There is that one half of us, which is fighting for all of our material stuff. And there is another half of us, which is fighting for our spiritual side. Um, and the divine gives us to our spiritual side all of the wisdom and knowledge and to the other side gives all of the might to fight for the material stuff that we need and so this is a battle that is not only just a battle between people it's a battle the ultimate thing of the gita is that it's a battle of of the opposites of life in this world of duality this battle that we have within So here, let's bring it back to this backstory of ours, of COVID and coronavirus. And uh, there's a part of me that kind of feels, uh oh, somewhere in some past um, circle of friends, we said this Armageddon cataclysm is going to have to happen, and many people are going to die. And um, you know, who do we see as being those that are going to die? Well. We just know that Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, and so if we can align, align ourselves with the meek, then we're going to be okay. And um, that kind of means that the thugs, the, the tzotzis of this world, are the ones that are going to be annihilated. And then along comes COVID. And we like, oh my goodness, is this the way nature is going to make this thing work? Um, are we in the beginnings of Armageddon. Is this the thing that's going to bring, a, bring about this spiritual transition and uh, change the face of the earth forever? And I don't think COVID's going to do it. I think it's awoken us to the fact that there is this thing that could just come at a moment's notice. And with all our fancy technology and with all our stuff, our cleverness, uh, it's just going to wipe us off our feet. Like, bathers in the beach when a big um, rip current comes along and washes half of the bathers out out to sea and gets the lifesavers on the go. Um, and we we sort of ill prepared for this, but maybe it needed to come and take take away so many people. And then when it's close to home, when it's my mom, I kind of think, oh no, goodness me, uh, would I want any of you guys to go? Hell no. Um, if COVID took any of you out, I'd be heartbroken, just as I was with my mom. Um, and with these families that are close to us, uh, that we know, and they, they're in the same predicament, we kind of say, it would be, ter it would be terrible uh, if, if they lost uh, one of their relatives, as this friend of ours you know, had succumbed to it yesterday. Um, and then we kind of say, but where's the fairness in all of this? You know, this is just not right. Um, we don't want it to affect us. It must not happen in our own back garden. Um, it must happen over there somewhere. It must happen with those who are not aligned with goodness. Um, but these things don't discriminate like this. Uh, they, don't, they don't have that same kind of mindset or ethics or um, mor morality. Uh, it doesn't have that. This is just a virus. Uh, and yet this virus is, is a gift from the divine. And this virus is going to come and it's going to prune out as it is doing. Um, but how do we make this reconciliation? Because we're attached to the outcome of, of all of this. We have, we have an overlay of uh, ideas and we, we kind of see this battle in that Christian way um, ha happening in that, in that metaphor of, um, of, of Armageddon that's written in Revelations. Um, and this is the forces of good against the forces of evil. But isn't that also the story uh, of Arjuna and his family? And it made me think, 
And I want to read a part of this. Um, so if I look down and don't look in the camera, please forgive me. But um, it's the part about, uh, it's um, shloka number two, it's about self-realization. And um, the dilemma here for Arjuna, because the whole story is written really um, like there's a reporter, uh, a journalist, and the journalist is just taking notes as Arjuna as speaks to Krishna. It's the story, the dialogue, really, between Arjuna and Krishna. There's not so much of the story about the factions on the other side. Um, and Arjuna, being a, a, a holy man, being a spiritual, spiritually minded person, is kind of heartbroken because he has to face this awful, awful dilemma of being here on this field of Kuruketra, lined up in battle, um, having to face not an enemy, not a clearly defined enemy. He has, to, he has to face his family. The guys on the other side who are ready to kill are, are brothers and sisters. They, they're aunts and uncles, or maybe not the aunts so much, but uncles and, and nephews. And uh, 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 you know, They're the ones that are out there. And he knows them and he loves them. Um, they're, they're his family. They're his, his kin, his kindred folk. Uh, and now what's happened is this is lined up in this almighty feud um, and he has to go out there and he has to kill them. How can he, as a holy man, go out there and kill his brethren? This is the real dilemma. Isn't it, isn't it a bit ironic as well? Because we're all brethren, really. We're all citizens of this planet. And even if there was this, this confrontation between Muslim warriors and Christian warriors, wouldn't we still be family? And wouldn't this same story apply in that same context? Uh, the fact that you, you, you see the other side as not being authenticated by God, how does that give you the damn right to go out there and kill your fellow human being? It just does not make sense in some sense. You know? um, there is no sense in it. When you look at it as we are, we are all part of the human race, and if we see ourselves as global citizens in this world of globalization, how on earth could we ever go and justify that? And yet a lot of wars are still justified on that very basis. I mean, the feuds America has with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the, in the Middle East, they're all mainly uh, about this thing of um, one uh, uh, ideology facing another ideology. Anyway, Sanjaya is the, is the guy who's the reporter. He's the journalist. Uh, and he's, um, he's the guy who uh, writes the story. So I'm going to skim over this. Uh, it's quite short, but I'm not going to go into all of, all of the detail. I'm going to uh, read some of it and paraphrase some of it just for, for today. So the, the two are, by now in the story, the two factions are lined up. Uh, Krishna, the avatar, the blue guy, is in the chariot with Arjuna. He is the placeholder of wisdom. Uh, Arjuna can ask him questions and Krishna will give him the wisdom that he has. Um, and we don't really know what happens with the might and power of Krishna on the other side, because Krishna can be in multiple places, I guess, at the same time. So Sanjaya, Sanjaya is, the, is the journalist here. And he says, these are the words that Sri Krishna spoke to the despairing Arjuna, whose eyes were burning with tears of pity and confusion. And it brings emotion as I say that now, because even now, isn't this where we're all sitting in terms of this virus, in this, in this kind of crazy war? Um, and why is Arjuna so full of pity and compassion and his, his tears are running down his face? Why? Because he's looking at his, on, at, at his uncles on the other side. He's looking at his family. And the family just have to, happen to be in a different mindset. They happen to be in a material mindset. They see their value in terms of material things. And they're fighting after the stupid kingdom. And Arjuna finds himself drawn into this battle. And as he's drawn into this, ba this battle, this is the very last thing he wants to do. If he had half a chance, he would back off. He would take all of his supporters and he would go the other way. And he would say, take this damn kingdom. The kingdom is not what is important. 
but we can't be attached to the outcome of this. If life asks us to be the warrior, if, if our spiritual dharma, our, our, our spiritual purpose is to be the warrior, then we can't be weak warriors. We have to be strong warriors. We have to go there and we have to face this. And that's why Arjuna is still there. He still has to face this. He can't get away from it. And so uh, Krishna says, this despair and weakness in a time of crisis are mean and unworthy of you, Arjuna. How you have fallen into a state so far from the path to, li uh, to liberation. It does not become you to yield to this weakness. Arise with a brave heart and destroy the enemy. And that's not the kind of advice we would imagine to come from an avatar of God. What God is kind of proposing here is dry your tears, man up, and go and fight. That's what you have to do. Uh, and he's, he's saying, how, how have you fallen? Just because you're a spiritual person, how have you fallen? How come you've fallen so far from the path to liberation? And um, arise with a brave heart and destroy the enemy. And Arjuna says, how can I ever bring myself to fight against these on uh, these uncles of mine who are worthy of reverence. How can I, Krishna? Surely it would be better to spend my life begging than to kill these great and worthy souls. If I killed them, every pleasure I found would be tainted. And I, and I don't even know which would be better for us to conquer them or for them to conquer us. These sons of my family have confronted us, but why would we care to live? if we kill them. My will is paralyzed, says Arjuna. I am utterly confused. Tell me which is the better path for me. Let me be your disciple. I have fallen at your feet. Give me instruction. What can, I over what can overcome a sorrow that saps all my vitality, even power over men and gods or the wealth of an empire seem empty? Sandhya says, this is how Arjuna, the great warrior, spoke to Sri Krishna with the words, Oh Krishna, I will not fight. He fell silent. As they stood between the two armies, Sri Krishna smiled and replied, replied to Arjuna, who had sunk into despair. Krishna says, You speak sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. And there's a hugely important statement that that is a statement that just sends shivers down my spine as I read it out. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. We do not get ourselves involved in the world of opposites. We do not stand aligned to one side or the other. The more spiritual we become, the more we go towards the middle and we find that sweet place of non-attachment. It's the holy space of indifference. And one has to realize that the backstory to this is one of reincarnation. If I, oh, not if, when I go back home uh, across the property from the auditorium back to the house and I take off these clothes and I put them in the wash basket and I take a shower, I do not grieve the, the loss of these clothes as they come off this body of mine. Um, I take these clothes and I put them in the laundry basket and I go and shower and I put on fresh clothes. And um, the cycle of life and death is exactly that same cycle. It is, should we grieve for the loss of this body just because this body is now old and worn uh, and we drop this body, we step into that spiritual shower of renewal and we reincarnate with a new fresh body somewhere in the future should we grieve for this old body? And the answer is no, we do not grieve for this old body. And so that's where Krishna's incredibly wise words come from here. The, um, the wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. Because one should feel grief for the, for the living because here we are in this time of coronavirus and we are full of grief for, and, and, and worry and fear as this tr thing like this Trifford starts to approach and get closer and closer to us. And so for in, in some sense, 
I grieve for the living because the living are, are in the space of fear. But I also celebrate the death because my mom, as she's passed now because of the virus, uh, is in a place where she doesn't have to suffer it anymore. And so I can very easily get myself tangled, and I do, in this world of duality. Which side must I align myself with here? Must I align myself with the, with the fear that is being carried in the hearts of the living? Or must I align myself with the peace and the surrender for the dead? But then um, there's a consequence to the surrender to the dead because the dead, when they are passed, leave grief in the hearts of those that, that mourn them and those that have lost them. This is, a, this is a terrible dilemma. And it's a dilemma that cannot be resolved when we stand aligned to one side or the other. We cannot find consolation in polarity in these times. We, the only remedy to this, as Krishna says, is to be wise. And again, to read that because it's so profound, there is uh, the, the wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. We come, we align ourselves with that place of holy indifference. We stand swayed neither by one side or the other. It's a magical place of non-attachment where we are not attached to the outcome of one thing or the other, one outcome or the other. Krishna goes on. He says, there has never been a time when you and I and the kings gathered here have not existed, nor will there be a time when we will cease to exist. And that's the comfort in this from Krishna is to say, if you hold on to your belief that you as a spirit being, which we were talking again just a, a, about this in, in one of our previous circles of friends, um, if you hold on to that belief that there is a part of you that was never born, if there is a part of you that has never died, that can never die, then that part of you is not, is not buffeted about by this happening that's happening on earth at the moment. It transcends that. Uh, it sits over uh, the, the, the belief of impermanence and everlasting uh, existence overarches that and how can you therefore because then that's how the wise do not grieve for neither the living for the, uh, than for the dead because we have to come and align ourselves with that with that magical place we have to we have to bring our consciousness to that part of who we are so that we can stay in that place of non-attachment as the same person inhabits the body through childhood youth and old age so too at the time of death he attains another body the wise are not deluded by these changes when the senses contact uh, when the senses contact sense objects when the senses contact sense objects a person experiences cold or heat pleasure or pain these experiences are fleeting they come and go bear them patiently arjuna those who are unaffected by these changes are the same in pleasure and pain, are truly wise and fit for this immortality. Assert your strength and realize this. Krishna goes on, he says, the impermanent has no reality. Reality lies in the eternal. Those who have seen the boundary between these two have attained the end of all knowledge. Realize that which pervades the universe and is indestructible. No power can affect this unchanging, imperish imperishable reality. The body is mortal, but that which dwells in the body is immortal and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight in this battle. I'm going to leave it there. It's a, it's a, it's an admonition that you would never have thought. Krishna would ever have given Arjuna. And it's not the, the answer Arjuna would have wanted as a man uh, standing there ready in battle. And earlier on, I kind of purposefully threw in something because it's something that I've been thinking about over this last week. 
uh, and I've been listening to a lot of Stephen Fry and a lot of um, uh, atheists. Uh, oh, damn. Let me, I don't know if we've lost something here or if we're still online. Um, we seen Ken Smith's screen. Oh, Ken, somehow it seems like you've shared a, a, screen. a screen. Can you just uh, stop sharing that screen for a sec? There we go. There we go. Perfect. No problem. I thought I thought Zoom had crashed on us. Um, so uh, I purposely through through some uh, been thinking about something, and I've been listening to people like Stephen Fry and um, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Hitchens and um, Richard Dawkins, and they've all been very inspiring in a way. And these are these are atheists. They are self-proclaimed atheists, and it's interesting to hear that story as well. And I think since we live in the world of opposites, if we believe in God, we also have to listen to the atheists. And we have to then find this middle ground ourselves. But anyway, um, I think it was something Stephen Fry said. And he said, what, uh, I, I might be misquoting him, but he said, um, the meek shall inherit the earth. Who are the meek? Are these some gay men who are just like, eh, I can't, I'm not going to deal with this. You know, I don't, don't give me a sword. I'm not going out there. Rather, just give me, uh, give me some fluffy things and I'll, I'll go and parade and I, I'm going to detach from all of this. Are, that, are those our future leaders? And I don't think that is true. That's not the meek, ineffective, in, in a, uh, you know, ineffective kind of people are not the ones that are going to lead. Um, and it was Chris, it was uh, Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry said he imagines the kind of person that Jesus was talking about as the meek shall inherit the earth as being Arjuna. And I thought, wow, that's pretty profound. Uh, this is some kind of guy who uh, is deeply compassionate. And, and it's not a guy. This can be equally well uh, a, a strong woman in, in this new uh, matriarchal society that I think is inevitable for a while. I think this pendulum swings back and forth and sooner or later we're going to see more of a matriarchal society than we are a, a patriarchal society. So when I say guy or Arjuna, I'm not talking about a man in a male dominated world. I'm talking about a person uh, in a different mindset of a world. But the meek who inherit the earth are going to be these kind of people that are ready to draw a sword that aren't that aren't silenced uh they have something to say and they they're ready to say what they have to say these are brave souls who are going to go out there and just like krishna uh, uh, admonishing arjuna to go out and fight uh and to be wise about this uh and the rest of the gita and i think it's time for another gita retreat as soon as we can someday um it, it is further on in the gita it's, it shows how um, because the big question is, how does Arjuna do this? How does he set aside these polarized beliefs of his? And how does he become that spiritual warrior that goes out there for the sake of truth? How does he, how does he become the soldier, but not in a polarized dualistic world? How does he become a soldier in a world of singularity? How does he go out there with love, without fear, uh, and since that's his dharma, how does he fulfill his dharma uh, in the most amazing way? And how do we fulfill our spiritual purpose in this time, um, and especially in this, in this um, coronavirus world that we're living in, which to me seems like a, a precursor to a much bigger, maybe Armageddon of sorts. I think I, think I have a a feeling, I don't know if you agree with me, Yvonne, but I think coronavirus is a, is a stepping stone, almost like a preparation for us, because if these things um, uh, have, have been ramping up, these viruses have been ramping up, sooner or later, they're going to mutate in a way that we're not going to stop them. There are not going to be vaccines for them or anything. And, you know, how is it going to, what is the world going to be like in 50 or 100 years time? And we've got a very short-term vision 
uh, for how we try and solve this problem and hold on to, cling to that which seems so secure, and that's the old, this old world order. But I, I don't think that we're going to get away with climate, you know, unless we do things with climate change, unless we embrace change. Um, we have to be brave warriors to stand in this new place, impervious of what's going to happen, even if it is to our own mother, and um, stand through this and be strong through this. Uh, otherwise, if we don't, uh, it's just going to undermine us and we're going to fall apart like, like Arjuna standing in the, in the chariot before his discussion with, uh, uh, with Krishna. Anyway, let me leave it there. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely story. It's a, it's a very uh, amazing story, the Gita. And I think if ever the Gita has relevance, it's kind of having relevance right now in this very, in this very age, in this very time that we're in. So um, I had muted all. Let me unmute all. Um, if you want to make comment, just as we usually do, just hand up, unmute yourself when I call your name, and um, we'll take it from there. Pam, I, I see restraint. I'm having not eaten one piece of chocolate cake through this whole thing. <laughs> Even if we leave it there, guys, that's that's fine. Uh, Nikki and Mona, I can't see your hands if you do put your hands up, but uh, I, I assume your hands are down. Um, but if we just leave it there, then that's a lovely thought to ponder for the week. Uh, and if you've got a copy of the Gita, this was Shloka 2, that, or chapter 2, if you like, in modern terms, uh, verse 2 of this, of this great poem. Um, go and read it. I think it's so relevant right now. Uh, and then we'll see you next time around, next Sunday. Go well. Bless you all. Cheers. Have a good Sunday. Bye. Bye.